I have to say this is a very interesting challenge because I think Peter asked me to reflect on what we'd learnt in the UK setting and uh, in give you some sense of why we think there's some exciting ways in which this could be applied in the development setting. Uh, and this, at this stage, is still very much design work. This is, there's no one out there with a proven model. Um, but I wanted to share with you um, some of the learnings that I've picked up as general partner of Peterborough over the last five years. I have to say it is the most exciting thing I've done in my life. I uh, have found every twist and turn of the way illuminating and exciting. And I have to say my understanding of the really profound power of delivering to outcomes has really deepened. Uh, and I want to share a bit of that with you today. Just a quick background on us. Uh, we're a non-profit organization. Uh, we did. Uh, innovate in terms of developing the first SIB in the UK. We've since uh, launched uh, four others, and we have recently announced that we've won three more contracts to operate in the UK. So there are a number of iterations we've gone through in terms of how these are structured, which I think we can play back, not just in this session, but also in future panel sessions. But it was very clear to us, uh, and largely as a result of some funding we received from Midia, that there was every reason to look at whether there was a chance to offer this to the development fraternity. Okay. Um, let me start with Peterborough. As I say, the, the fundamental theme here is the delivery to outcomes. Initially, what excited us about that was it was a way of raising investment capital, which could be rewarded by a return which is directly triggered by the delivery of a social outcome. Effectively, what we looked at was the situation of short-sentence male offenders in this country, 60% of whom are likely to reoffend within a period of one year at huge cost to the taxpayer and society. We were also aware that a number of voluntary sector organizations, civil society organizations, were very effective at working with this group, but never consistently funded. And actually, in many cases, had little robust evidence of the effectiveness of what they did. So as a result, we went to the Ministry of Justice and we said, we'd like to intervene with this group on a consistent basis. Uh, we will work with them both pre and most importantly post-release to deal with some of their immediate issues and some of the long-term challenges of reintegrating in a more normal society. As a result, um, we raised five million pounds. And on the back of that, we were able to fund work with a roughly 500 prisoners leaving Peterborough Prison over a period of six years. The important decision up front was what should we measure and how should we be judged? And the, the common assumption was that actually what really mattered was the volume of crime being committed by this group. And so we were actually measured by reference to the number of conviction events that accrued from this cohort. So we had a very defined cohort and a very simple way of measuring a positive outcome. That, uh, we went through a fair bit of debate around that, but that effectively incentivized us to work with the hardest to reach i.e. those people that can commit up to five or ten crimes a year. And that, from a social perspective, was extremely attractive to the investors that we were talking to. But then there came an important question of how could we attribute, essentially, the uh, success to the interventions that we had structured. And in this context, we went through an exercise with the measurement department of the Ministry of Justice, and I think we'll come back to data on many occasions today, where they said, we will look at a control group drawn in parallel from people of similar Category B prisons as Peterborough Prison, and we will assess the amount of crime being committed by that group where there are, in theory, no other interventions. And on the basis of propensity score matching, i.e. matching our cohort with people of a similar criminal history, similar age, similar ethnicity, we will judge whether or not you've achieved a material improvement in uh, a reduction in the level of crime. The basic assumption then was what sort of return would investors want for that type of contract. And so we worked through essentially with eight foundations who had funded activity with this vulnerable group for many, many years, what was a reasonable expectation uh, of our impact. And they felt that a 10% reduction over the life of the project would be something that would be very creditable 
and actually achievable. And so one of the more interesting pricing meetings that I've been at, we decided that would broadly equate to something like a 7.5% compound rate of return. I wish I could say there was more science to it than that, but I have to say in the early stages of a market like this with very poor data, that reconciled a number of different counterparties, not least uh, the sensitivity of the commissioner here at paying something like a double-digit return for what might be perceived to be pedestrian performance. And we always have to respect in this situation that people judge this performance in retrospect, i.e. if you deliver it, it seems to be easy. So we had to, that was essentially the matrix that we, equate, uh, we drew up together. Against that, we put in place essentially a model of delivery, which I think um, took us way beyond the issue of, of, of one charity delivering to this vulnerable group. It was quite clear, even from our early work, that the complexity of need required us to harness the efforts of a number of different people. And I think the important point about this model is the flexibility of the funding, that it allows us to respond to the needs as we find them, as they address, as we learn more about them during the course of the delivery of the program. And in this case, for example, when we set out, the very first intervention was around meeting the prisoner at the gate, an engagement pre-release and then immediate needs post-release around housing, mental health, around help with substance abuse, sometimes access to benefits. And that was essentially something that St. Giles for many years had provided. But there was other needs in terms of volunteer support, in terms of actual mental health, low-level mental health needs, which were not addressed by St. Giles. And I think one of the powers of this type of model is you can combine the efforts of a number of different groups around a delivery of a, a single outcome. And that sense of alignment and sense of partnership I think is one of the most exciting features of this model. So just in terms of the, the high level uh, power of the, of, of the delivery, I think it is this common shared purpose around the outcome, which informs not just the design of the upfront arrangements, but the way in which you iterate and work together going forward. And I mean in that, not just, if you like, organizations that are funded by the social impact bond, but actually the nature of your dialogue with all other counterparties working in the same area. And one of the values of this exercise is you put in place a platform which may last for multi-year period, which allows other entities working in the same area to become more effective at what they do. And one of the most exciting pieces of this jigsaw is the fact that other organizations and other counterparties become very effective and embed you in their strategic thinking. As I say, there's a very important sense of flexibility. We can genuinely try to understand the needs of our beneficiary and work around how we can better address them. That, as we'll come on to, inspired a lot of data capture, a lot of analysis about what worked and what correlated with reoffending. It became clear to us early on that the quality of the relationship on release was absolutely vital. It became clear to us if we met an accommodation need on release, that had a very strong correlation with the reduction in reoffending. If someone had a low-level mental health need, that also correlated with high levels of reoffending. So that actually led us to take investment decisions and really work at trying to deliver to that need. If you like, just to give you a sense pictorially of how the service developed, in year one, we had a very basic set of services. And I think what struck me was how little this group was actually understood by many of the observers. And the data that we had on this group was extremely poor. As a result of the work we did about essentially analyzing cohorts and particularly needs as they presented, you can see the richness of the, of the services it developed over the two-year period in the initial phase. This gives you a sense now of all the various stakeholders in the area that we work with. As I say, many of these we don't fund, but many of them see us as a very important strategic partner. As I say, we developed quite a, a lot of analysis around which pathways we're presenting and how were we delivering against those pathways. Did we have interventions that address need? Did we actually deliver on them? So there's one thing between having a good evidence base and the second, as we'll come back to, is the importance of implementation. This gives you a sense of how we've increasingly presented uh, services to support uh, the population. So there's increasing intensity and increasing breadth. We've increased engagement over the last five years. We're now actually working or at least assessing 94% of the people coming in. Let me remind you, this is a voluntary service. So people have to want to engage. There's no sense of uh, a punitive service here. 
And as you see, in terms of the second column in from the right, the number of needs that we're actually meeting has risen by fivefold. So as I say, I think the, the things that I'd like you to take away from our excitement about this is the, the reward for innovation, the essential client-centered nature of the service, the fact that we are actually looking at the needs as they present, rather than working to a set, if you like, a rubric that may have been negotiated up front with a commissioner based in Whitehall. The flexibility, not every person is, is the same. They have a very, very complex set of needs, and particularly with this group, I think the complexity is something that I would highlight. And last but not least, the rigor of what we're trying to do. So if I step back and try and distill what it is that drives the SIB, I'd leave you with seven or eight um, very simple, uh, if you like, filters for the opportunity. Can you identify a robust outcome metric which is unambiguously positive in a social sense? Are there any perverse incentives that might come to operate? The 17 investors that we brought together around Peterborough were very focused on this issue. And I have to say, if you don't get it right up front, there is absolutely no way you can rewire it later during a, an investment product. So the amount of work to really think through what is the best way of capturing progress, both in a, a social and financial point of view. Do you have a clearly defined target group that you're working with? This is all about measurement. People have to understand who is being assessed, who has actually been supported, and what the long-term impact will be. Is the cost of the intervention smaller than the potential value to society? Now, I think it's very important. In the case of this particular um, model, there was a sense that there were significant system savings from reducing the flow of prisoners through the court system and through the police, but no one really quantified them. Increasingly, I think, though, people are getting away from a narrow fiscal calculation of social value to something like, it is desirable that we have less rough, police, rough sleepers in London. If you go looking to support rough sleepers, actually you incur more cost. But there is a sense that somehow there is a social value to an outcome which may not be entirely related to the pound, shillings and pence of a tax saving. Yes, you need evidence-based interventions. After all, investors need to feel that they're backing something that has some proven record, but this is also, as I say, about implementation. And then we get to the really important challenge, which is measurable attribution, and this is where a number of the exciting models do stumble. Can you actually find a basis on which you can measure the direct impact of the intervention? What is the counterfactual? What would happen if this particular uh, operation didn't take place? And these are hard to negotiate. So it has to be a priority for the public sector or the commission or whoever is the donor in the development scenario. And it's got to be something that excites investors. And I wouldn't necessarily um, attach over overwhelming weight to any one of those. I think it's the balance of those that you need. But if I were to pick out two, I think the measurable attribution is probably the most difficult. And I think the issue of the uh, outcome metric needs a lot of thought because the risk of perverse incentives is something that all parties are concerned about. So how did we think about taking this thinking into the development arena? Well, I was approached early on in our work, just about the time that we were convening the working group. Um, we very much respected the fact that we had little development expertise within social finance, but we did come across through CG CGD the opportunity to connect with some very interesting thinkers across the globe in this area. And I think it was very clear from the early meetings just how exciting the potential of this delivering to outcomes might be in the development setting. I was approached by someone from uh, essentially linked to the University of Edinburgh who had seen, I think, a presentation somewhat similar to this around Peterborough and was immediately taken by the application to the problem of sleeping sickness, which is something that a group of scientists funded uh, by DFID had been looking at for over 15 years. This is a problem where there was essentially a race against time. We have two strains of the disease. One is a chronic strain in the north, and one is an acute strain in the south. In the south, Rudisiense is carried by parasites in cattle. In the north, Gambiense is, is carried by humans. The big public health risk is when these two may overlap. And as you can see through the series of sequences here, the uh, disease in the south is progressing. And as I'll come on to say, we've had further information which really un underlines the importance of this point. So there was a very interesting dynamic here. There was a very compelling case 
for upfront investment. Could we actually then, if you like, go through the filter of the various analytical tools that I referred to to see whether we could actually develop an intervention? The next exciting piece was that there was a proven method of dealing with the disease. This had been researched at length by Diffin and by Edinburgh, and essentially it came down to a dual treatment which involved a very sharp shock to the cattle which were carrying the parasite through trypanocidal drugs, followed by consistent spraying of insecticide using the cattle as live bait essentially to uh, kill the tsetse population which would transmit the disease. The important thing, if you look at the percentages, is we had to hit a very high percentage of the cattle in the first case, and we had to create a regular but less uh, intensive spraying behavior amongst farmers to follow. So come back to that model. I think where you have to combine two interventions around a single outcome, the power of performance management is actually really important. You can't prescribe how those two interventions would work but you have to coordinate them towards a single outcome. So this was essentially a, a program where the scientists felt if we were to deliver a very significant shock to the parasite prevalence in cattle across this high-risk area of Uganda, we would lay the ground for a multi-year process by which farmers' behavior would change, and they would begin to spray their cattle more regularly, and that would keep the disease under control. So upfront investment, but actually the ability to measure performance over a sustained period to make sure that the result that was achieved was actually a real tangible set, uh, measure of progress. So again, coming back to a chart that looks very similar to the Peterborough example, we have investors coming in at the top. Uh, we have a partnership. Uh, there is clear governance whereby there's a project director who is sitting on top of both these streams and then there's a measurement process, and I'll come back to some of the logic behind that, but essentially some element of return based on the proportion of cattle treated so long as sufficient penetration of the cattle population is achieved. And then, really importantly, in terms of the, the positive return to investors, evidence over a multi-year period that the prevalence has been reduced. Now, here's, this is our thinking. We are in discussions with DFID. There is no sense in which this is an agreed model, and nor is there a, a statement that DFID will be launching this. But I think, from my point of view, I've found working over the last couple of years on this really interesting parallels with some of our thinking, and I, I feel very, very assured in telling you that this model has stood the test of quite a lot of inquiry. And I'm very conscious in a world like this that if we launch a product, I really want it to work from every possible angle, whether it be the investor, whether it be the delivery model, and above all, whether it be the donor. So as I say, two strands of payment here. One is recognition that reaching something like 85% of the cattle population is in itself a huge achievement. It is also measurable. And we'll come, we've done a lot of work in develop, developing data systems to actually date stamp and GPS stamp the treating of a cattle. That not only allows us to uh, effectively report progress officially, but it allows us also to reconcile stocks of quite expensive drugs in the field. So there's a financial control element to that. And there is also a very important brigade planning, a, a planning of the intervention, which allows us real time to assess how we're doing. And in a complex uh, system where you may be working with up to two and a half million cows in, in a 12 month period, you have a multi-teams, you need to have that level of coordination through accurate data. But secondly, what we wanted to do was to actually demonstrate that we had achieved a material benefit for the long term. So when you come to measurement, cattle, the prevalence of the parasite in cattle is the most effective way of implying both animal health benefits, if it's reduced, and also the risk of human, uh, human uh, sleeping sickness. It's something that can be independently measured. In fact, we've had the University of Edinburgh doing a sample of 150 villages, which has given us an interesting baseline. The expectation would be in any model that there would be an independent evaluation of this would effectively trigger payments under the contract. The better, the, the, the more significant the reduction, again, that's a statistical exercise, the greater the payment to investors. And by profiling payments over a number of years, you can actually uh, incentivize, if you like, the long-term reduction. 
So over the last six months, we've been involved in an intensive exercise, if you like, to plan this, not just with the uh, value case for DFID in mind, but also how would we take this to investors? And that, if you like, is the cumulative experience I built up before I came into this industry. Investors are not specialists in this area, but they're very quick at flushing out people who haven't got a coherent plan. And so what we've done over the last six months is to ground truth the costs. We've done some very extensive market research around the behavior around insecticide spray. It's very important that we understand whether or not the farmer can use the correct product. We've built a lot of um, on-the-ground engagement with government. We've understood how we would interact with villages in the field. We've actually, and this is an important factor of any capital raising in my view, the problem with people who've spent their lives working on a particular bit of science is they become trapped by it. And I'm a generalist. I don't know whether this particular combination is the best combination, whether it's likely to work. So we got other um, tropical medicine specialists together to come and inquire and quiz the, uh, the, the scientists we're working with on this. And that has proved a very profitable and fruitful exercise, not least in reaffirming the quality of what they're proposing. And last but not least, we're looking at the finer financial choices that might be available to DFID depending on when payments are made. The longer it is before a payment is made, the higher the cost. And the more risk attached to the payment, the higher the cost. At the end of the day, the investor that will come forward here wants to achieve the impact of eliminating sleeping sickness in this area. And it needs, therefore, a convincing story that the project is properly resourced and the measurement is robust. So we've, we've ground truth the exercise in three different areas in Uganda over the last six months. Uh, we, we treated cattle in three areas which were chosen specifically because they represented the broad diversity of, regi uh, of, of regional agriculture, landscape, and cattle herd ownership. We, we developed a process whereby we mobilized the communities, we involved the communities in the treatment, we, we structured the way in which the cattle were presented. It was very important coming back to the need to treat 85% of the cattle, that we had a very high comfort level, that we were treating the vast majority of cattle in any area. We then went through a number of different models of treatment because at the end of the day, when you're treating two and a half million cattle, you have to really focus on how many you're treating in any day and what the most efficient way of receiving um, farmers might be. And don't forget, we're talking about at least eight different languages in this area. Actually, how you track a farmer through that process, how you record GPS stamp, date stamp, the treatment, and how you reconcile the, um, the use of products at the end of the day. I've been extremely lucky that one of my former clients um, has been prepared to spend a lot of time with me on this. He is one of the best operational managers I've ever seen. I have to say, Diffid, who visited this, was very impressed by the quality of delivery. If we don't hit 85% up front, the entire investment thesis would unravel. And as a result, just in terms of this pilot, and I accept it's only a pilot, we did manage to hit something between 96 and 98% of the cattle in, in the various areas we went to. We, there was a lot of excitement around this. I think the level of engagement, in a funny way, because it's so important that we get all the cattle in an area, you get the community working with others in the area to come and bring their cattle as, a, as an interesting self-discipline comes to operate. I mentioned prevalent sampling. This is, if you like, establishing the baseline. Where do we start? If, if, if we did nothing, this is the picture that would likely to persist over the next uh, eight years. What this has shown is the disease has actually migrated to the north. So again, this risk of overlap has become even more acute. There is an epidemic problem in the north. We're talking about, if you adjust for underreporting, there are nine million people at risk in this area and roughly a thousand a year dying from this illness. So there is an urgent need to deal with it. And the last piece which we've been working through is a really interesting exercise in behavior change. We have to change the attitude of the farmers towards spraying their cattle. The interesting thing from the market research we've done is that actually uh, quite a lot of spraying is going on, but they're using the wrong product. They're ill-informed on what they're doing. They're being sold counterfeit product. They're being effectively exposed to over-diluted product. They're confused about dilution of spray. So we've been thinking about how to unravel this. There are actually big challenges in certain areas where there are a long way from main roads on how to source the product. 
we spent a lot of time with distributors, but our, the, the net effect of this is we think in a, a consistent media campaign over a period of five or six years, where very simple messages around the need to use Tetsi effective sprays, the need to use them properly, the need to buy sealed packs, clarity on packaging. These are messages which I think could lead to a tripling or quadrupling of the market in insecticide spray in this area. And when we talk to distributors, the idea that we might go and spend this sort of sum of money over the airwaves in terms of a marketing budget for better use of sprays is a serious business opportunity for the distributors. But it needs careful management. And so I come back to the last piece of this, which is this adaptive management style, which is, comes back to what I tried to describe in Peterborough, where we were learning as we went along. We need to collect data. The project director needs to work on capturing the sales of insecticide spray. He needs to track hotspots of the disease in terms of reported human sickness. He needs a regular sampling in a random, on a randomized basis across the area to pick up whether there are intransigent levels of parasite in the cattle. And last but not least, he needs to work out whether there are white spots in the supply chain of insecticide spray. And when there are entrenched disease areas, and it's interesting, in some of the areas in those maps that I showed you, this disease has been prevalent for over 100 years and really not moved. There needs to be a sense of actually on-the-ground work, education work. There is a compelling financial logic for the farmer to spray his cattle. There is a big return in terms of animal health. Leave aside the human health uh, argument. So the double benefit of this project is not just dealing with one of the most uh, neglected tropical diseases, but also actually significant driver of the engine of growth in a poorer part of Africa. So just to finish on sort of one or two reflections, uh, comparing our work in the UK with this project that we've been working on over the last couple of years. Um, what is exciting in the development arena is you come across nuggets of research and understanding which are extraordinarily high quality. People have been spending large chunks of their lives researching problems. When we're working in the UK, very much we're trying to build that evidence base from the bottom up, and it's a much rougher process. I think there's a real opportunity here where people have wrestled with these problems and, and spent quite considerable resources over a number of years analyzing them to come to the investment model, if you like, with a much better investment-ready proposition. I think the bigger challenge when you get into the development arena is, is what is the quality of data you're using and what is the integrity of that data. Here, as I say, we can take a prevalence sampling before we start and then measure it regularly as we go through, and there's an auditable process whereby that can be reviewed to an international standard. So that, for my thinking, is why this particular project may actually have a chance of succeeding. But if you're working around things like employment actually, or disposable income, if, if outcomes are related to those, those are very, very difficult things to measure on a consistent basis. Yes, they're part of evaluation. They're an important part of evaluation. But don't forget, if actually that is what is going to drive outcome payments, that is, has a very significant impact on the behavior of the project. So uh, the challenge for me in a number of settings in the development world is the data robust enough? Is it independent enough? Is there enough history? in the data to actually work through the a measurement of change. I think there's a big challenge for commissioners. A lot of donors have very understandably wanted to manage the detail of how their money is spent. This process of stepping back and saying, what is the outcome I want to achieve? In this case, the reduction in the prevalence of the parasite in cattle as a proxy for the public health risk and for the animal health benefit. That means that actually the delegation of delivery to to the um, partner is, is, is very significant and a big contrast with the day-to-day -day life of many donors. I think we're seeing the cultural challenge of that in, in a lot of what we're doing. Um, I think it is obviously very important, even though they're not funding the activity, that you establish the right relationship with the in-country government. There are a number of things, for example, around the regulation of insecticide spray in Uganda where we need their help. They have effectively through the National Drug Authority every reason to look at the quality of product in the field. There is a massive value to working in tandem. We are using data, the epidemic data, for example, which is extremely sensitive from their point of view. We can't de effectively develop parallel worlds of data. We need to integrate as far as possible and build on their initiatives. I think if we do get to launch something like this, there are a number of ways in, the in, in which the in-country government can actually support it and build their own knowledge around it. Performance management, I don't in any way underestimate the challenge of delivering a project like this. 
Getting on a train traveling 60 miles to Peterborough is an easy exercise. You can do it three or four times a week and still get back. This is a very different level of logistical exercise. As I say, I feel very blessed to have had the support of a serious industrialist in planning this. Um, and I think that in terms of actively managing this sort of project over eight years, there is a real leap in capability that's needed to do that. You need the right mix of skills between the stakeholder management in country and the tight financial control and the assessment of data as the teams collect it. And last but not least, I think I can see in this field the opportunity to raise much more significant investment. Um, it's going to be needed because in order to make a difference, big sums of money are needed. In the case of Peterborough, five million went a long way. Uh, most of the SIBs in the UK are under 10 million. In this market, there'll be three or four times that size at least. Uh, and I think that will lead to a very exciting opportunity for investors, but it needs a careful thought about how you raise that capital. And as I often say to investors, it matters as much who you invest with as what you invest in, because the whole ethos of the project is driven by the people that back it. But I'll leave it there. I mean, those are the, our thoughts. I think there is a real power in terms of both social return and financial return from the investment model and the sense of accountability that it brings. Thank you very much, David. Uh, very informative, certainly um, evident in, um, in your presentation throughout is the, uh, the importance in uh, well, collaboration, um, Amidia's uh, role in sort of spurring some of this work on, very evident, but also the ongoing collaboration and, and cooperation with all of the stakeholders involved really came through very strongly. And, that, of course, needing to be uh, underlined with a very strong data collection, usage, uh, trust in the robustness of, of that data. So very interesting. And, and that, uh, of course, does lead to the ability to innovate and adapt to bring out one of the real advantages of this model. So does anyone have any questions uh, for David? So please just wait until the microphone uh, arrives and the camera is trained. Hi, everyone. My name is Ingrid Hagen. I'm from Cordaid, um, an international NGO located in the Netherlands. Thank you, first of all, for your presentation. Um, it was really good to see the robustness of the quality of measuring and of taking um, initiatives to do that. What I'm looking at is we implement, re implement results-based finance programs in many countries, in DR Congo and Afghanistan, also with the Global Fund, who's here today. And I think what we're looking at that we struggle with is what is the delta? Where's the cash flow delta when you're talking about investors? Because in this case, there's a cost to the farmers and there's a cost to society at large. But in how far is there a kind of data basis of who pays that cost and who's responsible for that cost to society in a country like where you're operating? Um, if I look at the Netherlands, where we have programs also for the poverty-stricken areas in the country, there's a clear kind of data structure and a pay structure as to what is the cost to society of a person who's on the dole, so to speak. And we work to try and, and straighten that situation, and we can get those cash flows from the provinces that are responsible for that cost to society, who would otherwise pay it out. So the preventative care is taken care of, whereby the cost to society and the government is taken care of. In the countries where we work, the kind of social safety net structures simply don't exist. So how do we find that kind of cash flow to compensate investors? And that's what I'm looking for in this particular uh, structure, what you're describing. Are these grantors or are they investors? Is it DFID who then can say, well, we're going to have this expected savings uh, preventatively. I can see myself coming out here with an advantage, which gives me a plus cash flow. So that's what I'm looking for. And maybe I'm just not understanding it. Thank you. Well, as I explained in the UK setting, the, the focus on tracing fiscal savings is, is, is clearly an important driver of interest. If, if a social problem is causing the system big uh, adverse impacts, then by definition it becomes a problem the Commissioner wants to solve. As I say, there is a, a growing awareness in the UK that actually the um, fiscal saving is not a particularly accurate measure in many cases of the social value of a particular exercise, nor are the savings particularly well caught. You may have one cost centre, but actually the, the cost of a poor outcome straddles a number of other areas. And so we tend to work on what is the hard saving 
and therefore what is the cost of achieving the, the softer savings which you won't be able to measure. And I think that's quite a helpful way of breaking it down. If you come to the, but I think that, as I mentioned with rough sleeping, um, effectively the GLA decided it was a problem that they were uncomfortable with in London. And they knew that if they were gonna spend money, they weren't gonna in a way achieve any savings because there were, it, was, it was something that, if anything, would attract greater cost. But what they were aware of is, is asking someone to deliver to outcomes meant two things. One is they only paid if it was successful. And secondly, they also knew that it would harness the innovation and the drive of the organizations that came to deliver to those outcomes in an environment where they could be flexible around a complex group. If you move to the development agenda, you know, there is no fiscal saving. Uh, there are metrics in terms of uh, the benefit to animal of animal health and human health to the economy in the long run, which are obviously important in terms of a value for money assessment. But there is also then a sense of if this was a problem I was going to deal with anyway or try to deal with anyway, this is a more effective way of doing it. Uh, but I, I don't in any way discount the challenge. We always have to show, um, certainly in this area, if it were DFID money, that it's value for money. Um, and, and we're very sensitive to that. I think the driver here, both in human health terms and animal health terms, because the benefit of regular spraying of cattle is not just that you deal with the tetsy risk, you also deal with ticks, you then deal with the risk of East Coast fever in the cow, and you lead to an entirely different engine of growth in terms of productivity of calves, uh, of cattle, and, and also the, um, the ploughing. And David, um, the farmers actually pay for the spraying uh, once once that pattern is established. Absolutely. I mean, we've abs we want to put in place a sustainable model here. So as I say, the, the thesis that we put forward in terms of using media to build a better awareness amongst farmers of what they should buy is that they buy the right thing and they prioritise their own cash flow. But it is essentially an economic decision of the farmer to buy the underlying product. So, so there is no sense in which there's a subsidy operating. The only subsidy that if you like, exists here is that we are spending through the media a marketing budget in those areas that no single distributor would fund on their own. But that is for a multi-year but limited period of time. Thank you. Does that respond entirely to your question? It does. Um, I think the, the concept of a, of a compensatory fiscal cash flow indeed doesn't exist in these situations. It's about preventive care in light of the fact that you expect the value for money. I think that's, that's the and it's a development goal that you see as desirable uh, and, and you see it as a rigorous way of trying to deliver that goal yeah. where it needs multi-year consistent investment uh, and, and only you will only measure success over a multi-year period. Thank you. I believe there was a question. Huh? From Thomas Anderson, uh, soon to start a role with BBC Media Action. Um, is there a... a um, a suspicion by the, the community that you're working with, the commissioners, that you know the private sector can do things more cheaply than we could have done it? And does that cause a reluctance for commissioners to kind of pursue this kind of agenda? Uh, because you know there's a sort of a private sector, public sector kind of mismatch and uh, suspicion that, that may slow down progress in this area. And particularly around the, the Delta, you know, that in the press there could be criticism that the public sector is pre paying a profit-making entity and investors are going to get a, a, you know, a, a, a real rate of return on, a, on an activity that the public sector would have done anyway in, in, a, in, a, in a traditional way. Uh, there are all sorts of sensitivities around that area. I think the, the, the recognition often amongst um, some of the people who've been operating in the developing world for many years is actually a number of projects have failed to deliver what they wanted to deliver. Um, they see that there is a, this adaptive management concept whereby you are reacting to the market circumstance that you have in front of you and reinventing the project on a dynamic basis is a model that's very difficult to create in a, in a commission sense, where you have effectively a list of outputs or KPIs which, which require delivery. I know that results-based aid is, is, is clearly more advanced here than it is, for example, in UK commissioning, but I still think that there are a myriad of targets and there is always a sensitivity that log frame governs everything. Whereas I think one of the important rigors of this is you find a variable 
parasite prevalence in cattle reoffending behavior, which captures exactly what you want to achieve in a measurable way, and thereafter you delegate responsibility for the detail. When I go back to that stakeholder diagram, as some of you may know, Peterborough is being brought to an end because the government has now launched a countrywide um, restructuring and probation. Um, but they're very keen to commission Peterborough, and we have, they have continued it on a fee-for-service basis. But when they looked at that map of stakeholders that I put up there, they were horrified, and they say, how on earth will we commission this? But this emerged essentially out of the market. This became what was necessary to deliver effectively over a multi-year period. And they basically, our contract says, keep doing what you're doing. And so I think there is a real challenge for commissioners to know exactly what should happen on the ground to the level of precision to direct that. And so I think it's, it, if, 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 if people are looking at that as the power of the model, irrespective of how it's financed, and I think it is important that the returns are respectable, and, but I think the argument is you're more likely to get the outcomes for the same money spent. And the benefit here is you only spend the money if it's successful, which is another important criteria. So perhaps if there, you know, there were a portfolio of impact bonds, some fail, um, some succeed, you perhaps make up some of those additional costs and some of those ones where you're not having to actually pay for the outcomes. There was, yes, please. Hi there, it's Julia Lee from Lions Head Global Partners. Thanks, David, for the presentation. And I think this slide sort of encapsulates my question, um, which is how do you, in a structure where there are multi-stakeholders and many of whom have been used to a commissioning process or not working from a private sector viewpoint, and they work on a not-for-profit, uh, purely charitable basis for a social outcome, how do you incentivize parties in the structure to then work on an accelerated basis or a coordinated basis for the outcome of the dip, where they know that there's an investor and commercial outcome to achieve from the investor's point of view, but that traditionally they're not in that sector? How do you provide those incentives? both in this example and in Sleeping Sickness? Well, all these organizations here are not-for-profit organizations. Uh, none of them are taking financial risk on this project. Uh, we paid them revenue. In fact, probably better revenue than they would have had through a normal contract. Uh, so it was more than cost recovery. Um, they had a greater visibility on how long they would be part of the project than they've ever had under a, a, a publicly commissioned contract. Um, what they've invested, to be honest, is their reputational capital. Because if the intervention fails for whatever reason, then the question is actually the way in which they've justified their existence, is it actually sustainable? Now, fortunately, in this case, we've showed a measurable reduction in reoffending. But actually, also the complexity is that we've actually asked them all to work together, which at times has been testing, because the DNA doesn't always lead that way. But I think th there is a really exciting opportunity here for NGOs to get much better longer-term funding uh, as part of partnership in projects like this. And I would say there's no explicit NGO involved in the delivery of, of the sleeping sickness because it's more a sort of uh, military-type operation around the treatment of cattle and then a market development activity. But I'm absolutely convinced in that second phase that there are real opportunities for NGOs in the field to work with farmers to develop a much broader veterinary health beyond the pure treatment of the uh, uh, sleeping sickness. I think we had one other question, and then perhaps uh, we, we can save further questions for the panel discussion. Hello, I'm Jackie Leslie from Coffee. And one of the things that struck me a little bit about what you were saying is um, with the sleeping sickness in particular, it's a very fairly vertical kind of process and it's quite a focus it's a very focused process and not not just in animal health but also in the same kind of idea with the Peterborough offenders um, situation um, what happens when people are very focused on one particular area and perhaps neglect other areas to do with uh, foot and mouth disease or other diseases, or they're focused on helping offenders um, with mental health problems rather than other people in society with mental health problems. Does the design and the measurement of these things take that type of um, use of resources from which might have been available to other, other wider beneficiaries? Um, does it take that, that, those types of issues into account as well? 
Well, I think you're, you're right to highlight that we were not trying to solve many other problems in Peterborough with this model. Um, on the other hand, what I would say is because we actually brought resources to the area, which were not competing with other people's resources, they themselves became more effective in delivering to those groups. So, for example, if someone on our cohort needed mental health support, we brought resources to that, which meant that the other mental health services in the area were better able to support other groups. Um, so I, I don't, don't for a second think that we have a one-size-fits-all solution here, but I think that this is just a tool in the toolkit uh, for, for, for a much wider uh, set of interventions. Right. Thank you very much, David. Thank you.